All right. Hey, welcome everybody to the Gopher CEO channel. Again, thank you so much for coming on board, you know, listening today to another special guest in a different type of industry and in the research industry. You know, uh, what we bring to the table is startups to 25 million in revenue and so excited to kind of just keep on diving deeper with local business owners, local entrepreneurs, you know, new encore careers. And this gentleman today, uh, Mr. Bart Zarin, uh, is going to share with you a pretty unique story. I've done a little bit of research on him and kind of seen the background of it. And we had a great conversation before we came on board. And uh, we're going to have about a 45 minutes to 60 minute discussion, share a little bit about what's going on and share his entrepreneurial mindset. So welcome, Bart. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, let's tell the, uh, the audience a little bit of kind of your background, uh, you know, the start of maybe the idea of ERM and and how you started to put that together, but a little bit of your background first. Sure. Okay, great. Yes, I am in marketing research, and that's been my background, custom design marketing research projects where we have one corporate client uh, or individual even as a client, but we're doing a project that isn't a standard off-the-shelf type project. It's custom design for them, the way consultants operate. And so that's how I learned it early on. Uh, I was... Uh, Undergraduate, I have a BS degree in economics from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And I did go on to graduate school, but before that I started in the working world and went to grad school at night. So I got early start. And uh, over the course of many years, I've worked in both sides, actually all three bases of marketing research. It's one of those categories where there's supplier side, of course, the companies that do the marketing research projects for their clients. But then you can be a marketing research guy really on the corporate side as well and contract with market research firms, engage them, you know, have a budget, uh, have company needs for research because they're making important marketing decisions. And so those are two sides of the fence. And then you can do some academic work like in many fields. So I actually have experience in all three over time you, know, you became well rounded in the in the industry right. what, uh, what 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 really intrigued you uh, initially to kind of get into that field and then um, yeah. we'll kind of walk through your, your career and then get you up to speed to ERM okay sure a uh, well a job opportunity that uh, seemed to fit with economics background it's sort of a rigorous background in college some math of course but also analytical thinking and that kind of uh, rigor to it. And I actually enjoyed the economics class. I had started out in liberal arts, but I switched to business college at U of UIC, essentially to admit this because I didn't run foreign language anymore and it was required in liberal arts. I did it for a year and one more quarter and then I said, no, <laughs> let me get into business. And so I did get my BS in economics that way. Uh, and then in looking for work, uh, I didn't necessarily know that I wanted marketing research as opposed to maybe a, a job in a firm that does economic consulting, you know, at a junior level. And I thought I had a good shot at one of those, but I didn't get the initial interview. I, I remember the phone call to this day when I got the, <laughs> the denial for the opportunity to interview. It hurt, you know, but uh, marketing research is analytical too. And it was close enough and I got a job at Allied Badlands as a marketing research analyst. It was a long commute, but it was good experience. And the thing about it, I found out without even trying ahead of time, I was going to end up with a career where when I got jobs on the corporate side, they were going to be startup jobs, entrepreneurial in nature, because they didn't have marketing research designated yet as a staff position in the entire company. And I was at the corporate, you know, the national headquarters for a big moving company, the biggest at the time. Uh, and responsible for starting out the marketing research function and seeing what we could do to build it. And I had a good guy who hired me, uh, gave me a chance. And I learned a lot in that job. I worked with the ad agency, it was Young and Rubicon at that time, and learned about marketing, or learned about advertising and advertising research and about customer research and a number of other types of projects. Ended up after three years having a staff 
person, two staff people, the secretary, which is what they called them in those days, <laughs> and uh, the marketing analyst, a, a guy I'm still friends with uh, as my marketing research analyst and I was promoted to manager. Um, so that was a few years. Then I went to uh, the supplier side because I've sort of tried to put the word out. I want to really learn this field. You know, I like it from the corporate side, learning from the outside firm and, and trying to get more budget to do the next project uh, for the company. And so I did. I got a, a job, very, I guess, looking back, formative opportunity with a small but very smart market research firm that uh, had, even at the um, annual dinner party, we had one round table with spouses, and that was all we needed you know, for the whole firm. Uh, but I learned a ton and uh, very useful later in my career. I'm very grateful for that opportunity to work with a small firm of very smart people and did some work called market segmentation, which is a major kind of study. I could go on and on about that, yeah. along with some other kinds of reasons, taste tests we did for uh, uh, confectionery company as to how much sugar should they put in the product or sweetener, you know, and can a consumer detect the difference or not? And so there's, you know, of course, rigorous ways to do that kind of testing with consumers. Uh, so then I ended up uh, after that, let's see, going back to, uh, yeah, going to Northern Trust Bank. Oh, wow. You had a good opportunity there. And again, corporate side, a new position reporting in the communications department, marketing communications department, to start up the marketing research function. Great opportunity, you know. So I did that. And uh, the work I had learned to do paid off in knowing how to do that kind of project at a big corporation and get a lot of recognition for it, a lot of credit for diagnosing. In that case, it was a high wealth consumer marketplace. If you know about Northern Trust Bank and their history, you know, that's where they are. Ultra elite wealth, yeah, I guess. Right, right. And so we did, in fact, the study, uh, I'm very proud of it. Um, one of the fellows that worked with me at the prior supplier firm had left that firm and went to a bigger market research company. I did the project with him. So we got along so well because we had worked together already. And uh, anyway, I'll just summarize that by saying the results are so well accepted that uh, the personal wealth department trust services wanted it presented at their annual meeting. Now they didn't, I wasn't in their department, I was in this you know, corporate department, so I wasn't able to go to the meeting, but my work was represented there, you know, by their people, and I was very proud of that. And uh, in order to do the presentation, we planned quite a bit about it. And in a nutshell, the findings were put to music, I like to say, as a way of representing these six different consumer segment types. They're like personas, they are called today in some cases, but very deep, rigorous market research had identified six types of consumers and uh, how to best approach them, how to prioritize them. You don't go after all six, no matter who you are as a competitor, you can't be that multifaceted, probably. You know, and they had one that was a their rock solid market already, who knew them and loved them. But I thought the best way to present that to the audience of the sales force and the marketing people in that department, their annual meeting, was with music. And so that's what we did to tap into and to convey the theme of the types of people who each segment identified. Rather than trying to draw a picture or a photograph, something I thought would be too oversimplified and stereotypical, perhaps too much. The music is more thematic, you know, and it doesn't give you a visual, but it gives you a, a sense of mood. Yeah. Right? You know? And uh, anyway, we had. Uh, not much difficulty coming up with five pieces of music. The sixth one was kind of tough. And there was a creative person in our department. I talked to him about it. He listened to me describe this type of consumer. And like that, he said, I won't dance. Don't ask me. <laughs> really old piece of music. You know? So 
But yeah. first of all, this research goes back in time, and secondly, the market segment was, you know, old people. Uh, and so that that gave us all the music pieces we needed, which really, you know, livened up the presentation. You know, you bring in uh, a lot of sensory, you bring in, um, you know, different areas and, and you start really, you know, they talk a little bit about uh, emotional intelligence nowadays. I think right. you were mastering that, uh, you know, <laughs> many moons ago, yeah. uh, trying to sell that, that type of concept and, you know, guiding a big ship, especially a, a big company like Northern Trust and, and you being a guy that's innovating within there is pretty awesome. So right. you, you lay, you, so you lay a lot of foundation, Bart, about, you know, going to school, Mm -hmm. uh, not really getting into specifically your degree, which many people, I'd say 90% uh, of people get a degree and don't even do anything with that specific degree, yeah. uh, ironically enough. Right. And you find this niche, you find great mentors, it sounded, you find people that gave you a chance, you right. find opportunities. Um, did that start to lay the foundation of what you would believe in the future that that helped you become an entrepreneur nowadays because of just yes. that open-mindedness, that seeking capability. Give us a little bit about that, that type of scenario of yourself and, and then we'll go into ERM and how, how you started this business. Yeah. Well, I do think the entrepreneurial, I mean, I had three of them actually. Allied Van Life is the first one. Um, two other corporations I worked for also started up the market research function from scratch and grow. So I think that entrepreneurial work was fabulous for me to feel more confident and sure-footed in being purely entrepreneurial and operating my own consulting business, you know, much later. Uh, it wasn't even a, uh, much of an adjustment in a way. Sure. You know, it was just doing it on a much smaller scale in terms of people around me all the time. Uh, but so, you know, and later in my career, I, the next company I did it for was Northern Trust. I think, I, I guess I mentioned that. And then from there, I went to Citicorp Diners Club Division, North America, which had been in New York City and was relocating that portion of the Citicorp business to Chicago. This is back in the 1980s. And uh, we were hiring there for in the Chicago area. And at least they put out the word. And... Uh, so I, I got the job, I was thrilled to get it. It was a big step up, both in rank and you know, some extra money, um, recognition. I was a, brought in, as were many other people in the marketing department as a vice president and had the duty to manage the uh, installation of a marketing research function on a more elaborate scale than Northern Trust. Uh, and I found myself when I got in, surrounded by other guys at that level, really smart guys. And uh, they were mostly guys, but some females that got better for women over time, naturally. Uh, but um, all of them, or almost all, were from packaged goods backgrounds, mm -hmm. which in marketing is what it was all about. You know, that was where the big money was, the, the career path, ideally, in the best schools. But um, so I remember saying to my future boss, uh, I'm, I'm glad I can be three years, I think it was five years with the bank, Northern Trust, and you'd still consider me for this job. <laughs> because what would they want with a banker at a aggressive packaged goods types of mentality company that is there to make things happen for consumers, you know, and uh, be very successful. But uh, he did, he brought me in. He, uh, he and I had a good relationship. I admired him quite a bit. He didn't stay very long. Within a year he had left to go back to North Carolina. I think it was mostly homesickness. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Interesting. But the you rest know, of my stay there was exciting and was really formative. So you, that, that means it's another, it's another good path into kind of uh, a, a, a chunk of time, right? That developed yourself again and your skill sets. Right. So, you know, obviously, it, you know, it's pretty apparent that you've had this flourishing career. Uh, the intrapreneur, which I love that word. It's something that uh, the Gopher CEO channel we talk about and and we'll be bringing on new interviews with people that are like that as well. So not only just CEOs, founders, um, you know, entrepreneurs, but intrapreneurs, because we really, 
I think that there's a lot of people that have that type of mindset that are inside of a corporation that feel like their position is like they own their own business inside of it. So no. uh, pretty neat that you that you are able to self-discover that and just and treat it that way. And then obviously getting getting a chance with different industries and different capacities, but still in that same plane of the way that you think. So awesome. I, I you know, I will say, you know, what really, I guess, developed if you think about two or three different attributes that get you to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you have a flourishing career, you learn so many things, you really craft yourself into this expert, you know, but you never took that lunge until you almost kind of get to retirement age, right? So yeah, get, well, get us through um, that and, and what yeah. happened to, to move that over. That, that was actually some time ago uh, after my my taste for corporate life kind of changed okay. and, uh, uh, by myself where I had thought about it and uh, it seemed to be a good opportunity to do it. I had lots of contacts and network. So I was able to step into some work pretty quickly. And uh, after I had left City Corp uh, Diners Club, I did some uh, other back again then to the supplier side even a firm that was global in its work and did marketing research and marketing analysis mostly, but I was able to bring some marketing research you know, clients to the, to the company and uh, had occasion to go to India for a business meeting and uh, London on the way to, to India and had a uh, good experience and uh, made some friendships on a global basis. It was kind of cool. My work was to bring in clients in the U.S., client companies, where the analytical work would be done there, but the, and the research, in my case, it would be an interview project with consumers or with business prospects for this co American company that wanted to develop its business in another country and mm -hmm. use, you know, through me, this global firm. Um, so I really, my, my projects were in the U.S. for research consumers with them. It was more totally international work. You know, even though I was, had never been much of an international traveler myself, I had the firm back me up. So my role was to be at the U.S. side. So it actually fit pretty well. And it was pretty good. And it, it enabled me, too, to prepare for being totally on my own. Um, and so I also, you know, did took on some responsibilities doing qualitative work. It's what we call it in our trade focus groups. I would moderate them as well as run the entire project, plan it, you know, subcontract for the facilities, individual depth interviews by phone or in person with target individuals, and then write the report through the presentation, you know. So I added that to quantitative work. And when we, as an industry, started to be able to do quantitative surveys on a computer, uh, I learned about converting, you know, what I was accustomed to, the old fashioned ways of doing it, to managing the project that way. And, and that led them to ERM and me making a, a business out of it, online surveys. And I acquired the software, purchased it. Uh, many years before, actually, the common, widely available software websites and apps, they call them now, and this was before we had apps, but it was a software. So I'm, I didn't subscribe on a weekly, monthly basis. I purchased the software. I'm still in real close relationship with the guy in Boston who I bought it from. And so I, I upgrade that when it's available to keep up to date and use that to enable me to do surveys without needing a company surrounding me, you know. And, uh, what was the initial investment, if you don't mind me asking, uh, just to kind of lay the foundation right you're you're in the corporation you're giving the having these experiences yeah uh, you see the software that is kind of changing right uh shaking ground within your within your industry to sure. give a different way of doing things what was your belief and and how much was that capital investment that you would later flourish into you know starting well, uh, well this didn't flourish into multi-million dollar business on my part okay i want you to realize one thing about being individual is they don't need a million dollar business <clears throat> and not paying staff. You know, I uh, support, I purchase, but that's, of course, calculated in the 
bid that I submit, mm. my costs. And since I'm a custom design research consultant, when the project's over, that's it for my relationship with that client until another project comes along or they like an idea that I give them for a follow-up project at uh, some time. So in that way, um, it's nice and tough because I have to recreate the business and I can do more than one client at a time, of course, too. But um, so it's not like I'm as an attorney or an accountant, I get a client and then they're retaining me over time to do their monthly reports. Mm. Everyone else, it's an engagement. You know, custom design market research might be, if I get lucky, a project like that. And I could give an example or two. Uh, but for the most part, it's a project in an ad hoc manner because it's designed to answer a question that isn't a standard everyday question that they have. It's, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so they're more creative projects, they're more individual type problems you're addressing that may come back again, but there's no guarantee. Of course, it varies with this kind of client. Um, so that's why I'm saying uh, it was built largely on reputation and uh, networking and prior work that I had done and become known for that helped a lot. At the ADA, American Dental Association, was a client of mine which was because TransUnion, one of the credit bureaus, had been a client prior to that. And an individual who was on the staff, Dennis was my you know, client contact person. He ran the market research department. One of his staff people was there for a period of time as I was working with Dennis mostly. He went to the ADA. And so because of that, he called me and I'm not saying I was his only market research supplier, but I got a nice stream of work from there too. So it was from networking you know, and experience and reputation. And, uh, and the nice thing seems too, I mean, having had the experiences that you have, um, you knew kind of the budgets that these companies would have, the allocation of assets that they could bring to the table, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe siphon off a chunk of it. Obviously, like you said, being an individual sole proprietor uh, at the moment of uh, launch, you, you also don't want to get overwhelmed and not deliver uh, a good product or, you know, a good uh, yeah. search, right? So, but again, so just to go back just a tiny bit, um, sure. that initial capital investment um, in those oh, times. Hundreds of dollars for that software. Okay. So, yeah. so you get it. And then, and then there's a licensing that you have to upkeep throughout the years. Nope. I own the software. It's a product that I purchased. Okay. So it's all yeah. yours. You're not licensing it. So neat. No, and then. No. I buy it from the guy who licensed and owns it. And oh, okay. It. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's his business to make okay. this a product of his. And, okay. and uh, I don't even remember how I first heard about him, but one of the smartest things I ever did was to buy his software. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then you just, you, you buy, I guess, uh, however the, the real term is, but whatever the upgrades are, and mm -hmm. then you download them into. And, you know, it's an interesting concept, right? I mean, you know, you're, you're again, you, you have a, a job, you're an entrepreneur this whole right. time. You, you make a decision, you make an investment, you know, you start to think and formulate, well, hey, I've got context here. I've got worldwide context now that I've made. I've got right. this history. I can put myself out there in the marketplace and really become my own business. Uh, maybe at, obviously at, at lower levels than a Northern Trust or a diner's club, but uh, nonetheless, you control your time now. You control your efforts. You control the way that you do business. So, so what what was one of the first initial go to markets? Um, you know, give us a little bit about. You know, did you leave a job? Did you build a business while you have a job? Okay. What was that transitional period to going all in? Now? Yeah, that was back in the year two thousand, actually. Um, and so, what I'm doing now was not on the table then at all wasn't even in my head okay so mm -hmm. just be clear so my business as a marketing researcher is my business as a marketing researcher now only i've evolved it i've left what i started to do behind uh because i got to be retirement age and level and didn't want to be full-time and but was nagged by this idea in my head for how new entrepreneurs can get it better i thought 
because my work was not with them before. It was with companies that had lots of money and a big budget, you know. Yeah. So I think what my innovation is, is to think through what's the hardcore minimum that entrepreneur needs to get from a research project about his new product idea that is really empowering and answers their exact specific strategic questions. Not some general questions about consumers, you know, in the popular literature. Read all that you want, but we need to ask questions about your product from consumers that are all about the ones you're aiming for. Mm. And do it in a confidential proprietary way so it doesn't see the common light of day because it's about your, Mr. Entrepreneur, your strategy in marketing. So it's sensitive by nature, right? And if you're doing it early, which I advocate, your product is not a product yet. It's a concept, it's an idea. Okay, so you have to protect that information. You know, I can, uh, I'm talking with a, a young entrepreneur now about a tech product, that's all I can say about it. Mm-hmm. it may be all I can say about it forever and ever. <laughs> it may change, but someday I can relate the project and certainly not the findings, you know. That's the nature of the work. Um, uh, so then, I, thought, I, I thought of a way of doing it very compact, concise, and not expensive. Yeah, right. and, and you're giving back in a way, right? I mean, you're yes. with this business, you're actually going back up the rungs a few ladders. Yes. Uh, you know, the Gopher CEO channel really talks to startups to 25 million in revenue. And 25 million, you're still a baby, uh, you know, even though it's a, it's a strong company. Right. Uh, you know, you could be very fragile uh, after 25 million, which is the, re- the, the way I did I, my research for this channel. I just didn't see enough people talking to these types of business owners. So I love that you're really sharing the ideas. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, if you replay the last three or four minutes, I think Bart really breaks down a, a really important part. You know, if you're going to market and you haven't put in your research, you know, think about a company like, like Bart, do business with a guy like Bart that can really give you that ammunition to feel super confident to get into that go-to-market strategy. So interesting stuff. So, um, you know, what's, what's something that you could share um, as far as, you know, you, you put in this software, you, you start mm-hmm. getting out there, you start getting into the clientele. You kind of went down a couple of rungs as far as just like not the Northern Trust, our clients anymore, but right. you still had some, you know, some high affluent clients. Oh, yes. so yeah. What, yeah. What, what were some of your own marketing strategies, not so much your marketing research that you actually do? What, what did you do to stay active in the market to bring clientele to yourself? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I was a member in my industry's association. I would, generally speaking, without knowing any group in particular, I'd recommend doing that. The American Marketing Association, in my case. And I never took office, office holder positions in its administration, but I was a member. So I would attend, you know, social meetings, business meetings, speeches, events, national meetings. Sometimes I was sent by my employer to do that and to learn what's happening in the industry. Uh, But also just to meet people. I uh, got a client through at one time when I was with a small research firm, you know, made a connection, brought them to my boss who was at the meeting too, and we ended up getting some work. so yes, join your you know your industry associations. Um, know what your firm. In those cases, I was an employee. Know what your firm is about and how it fits into the sort of constellation of competitors in the industry. You know, in many industries, the different competitors take a different slice. Of course, you know. Some are big and do big projects. Some are small specialty companies. Some are all about the psychology of the consumer. Some are more about the mundane details of what did they buy this week? What brand did they buy next week? And you know the facts. Um, So know where you fit, know what you wanna do next. Try and figure it out or what you really like best and least about maybe the work you're doing in terms of the mix of clients, mix of projects. and uh, I just, it's not like I had this premeditated. I certainly didn't. And when I was on my own, I was able to leverage my contacts, my prior employment. I had a nice long relationship with a different part of Citibank. 
not the charge card business, but the retail bank in Chicago. That uh, was almost like an independent contractor, but I was not an employee, I was inside. And uh, that was really good for a sustaining um, relationship that was more than paying the bills. And yet I was independent enough to do more as I could acquire other clients. And so somehow or other, just from that kind of uh, getting out there uh, on the street, getting known. Oh, I would say too, uh, trying to get some visibility. I did some speeches in different AMA meetings. I uh, got on the road a little bit that way, presenting my work in a way that was okay to reveal publicly, you know. Um, and so, I have a list of those kinds of events. I, oh, I also had a chance back in 1988. How can I, <laughs> I didn't write this whole book, but I did write a chapter. <laughs> chapter so you co-authored, okay, awesome. Chapter two, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, I was at that time commuting on the train here in Chicago to Beverly Morgan Park neighborhood where I lived at the time, I had a nice house, wife and daughter. And uh, uh, Steve rode the train with me. Sometimes we'd meet on the train going home. Didn't see him much in the morning, but uh, one time going home and he asked, he told me he was writing a book, organizing writing a book. He's the editor. And uh, I jumped at it. To say, I don't know if he, <laughs> I don't know if I waited for him to ask me if I said, all right, all right. I'll do it. I'll be <laughs> yeah, you had a lot of thoughts at those times, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. you you had developed so many things that and, and in your mind you wanted to share right and a book is credibility a lot of times too right uh, you yeah. get a book out there even if you're co-authoring um yeah. it, it really puts a, a cementing credibility out there that's awesome mm -hmm. yeah and i like to write i learned writing actually from home my sister was very good for me older sister uh, mother was very good with grammar and uh, uh some good teachers so i always enjoyed that i like even writing research reports People told me well, my website is too wordy. <laughs> Believe me, that is after that website's been in place for several years. If they think it's wordy now, they should have seen my first draft. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, love you know, I listened as much as I could tolerate listening to this criticism over the years. It yeah. showed me many versions to get less wordy. Still, I get it's too wordy. <laughs> But uh, and and so everybody knows it's uh, www.your y o u r hyphen yes. research hyphen resource dot com. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. A quick shameless plug there, but uh, okay. awesome, awesome. So so look, you, you know, you described how how you were starting to go to market, how you also were really developing something while you still had a job and kind of creating this. Uh, and you know, and and ladies and gentlemen, you know. Part of being an entrepreneur, part of being an entrepreneur is, is allowing yourself to just have these moments, right? Have these opportunities. You're on a train ride and, and you just, you, you find that your colleague or person that you're, you're friends with is building a book. You put yourself in there, right? right? Uh, you're, you're, you have a job and, and you get known in industry. Somebody asks you to do something outside of your day-to-day, -day, nine to five, and you're willing to do it, yeah. right? And that's the things that start to lead to a business, Right, I'm getting goosebumps actually. It's funny because like, those are things that I, I feel like some people just don't allow themselves to be a part of, right? It's okay that you work a job, right? And you have an entrepreneur mindset, but do things that will allow you. There's a saying, I forgot who it is, maybe Gary Vee or someone famous that says, you know, if you're willing to put 40 hours of work for someone else and not the equivalent possibly outside of it for yourself, oh, yeah. you know, it, it, it could be you know, a recipe for disaster. So at least put another 10 or 15 hours, which is sounds like what that's what happened to you and you started building it. So, sure. so let's get to uh, just uh, how, how you start to then develop your operations. Like do you start to, you know, you had the software to really help your clients to develop this marketing research. And you obviously had all this experience. What are some things that you did operationally once you started going on your own and just mm -hmm. being completely on your own? Like, um, you know, did you have timelines for clients? Uh, did you have a 50% upfront fee? You know, what were some kind of intricate things that allowed you then now to become sure. you know, self-sufficient? 
And again, of course, because in the past I had been on both sides of project contracts. I was the supplier getting the project endorsed and you know signed off on by my client. I was the client signing off on them and making sure I had the budget, you know, or getting the budget from management. So I knew both sides of it firsthand. Uh, I write up a, um, a statement of work and that authorizes the project. So I describe in detail what we're going to do after any number of conversations about it. Uh, and so we agree conversationally, then I write it up, uh, the client reviews it, signs it, and that engages me. And then I do the project. So in the preparing the budget for the project, I have checked with the, the contractors I am gonna subcontract with, if needed, to do the project. So if it has a qualitative component, I'm gonna to go to Denver, I'm gonna to go to Boston or wherever and do focus groups, some in Chicago perhaps, I make one call to a firm that can do all of that administrative setup. They're in that business of having those facilities back before we did them all online. <laughs> uh, so short answer is I subcontract with firms I have been used to working with many times in the past or firms like the firms I have been used to working with. Being a member of the association, again, helps. You know, you meet people that way. Uh, so it's a business and it had been back when I got into it uh, on my own that was set up for this kind of thing. Mm. So it wasn't difficult. I didn't create something out of nothing. So in a way I cheated, you know, <laughs> I took what's already there. I put out my shingle uh, and it's always been out of my home when I've been on my own. And uh, even before COVID, you know, <laughs> and uh, and I use my phone now, email to engage the support I needed, which I had calibrated and put into my proposal. So I felt I was covered. I knew where the risks were to the budget, and I would talk that through the client. They would understand it. It was specified. If we needed to, you know, embark in a different direction, that was already anticipated. So it was all very familiar for me. And I realized just as I had from my desk as a VP at Citicorp, I and my staff, I was able to build up a big staff and a big budget there, by the way, compared to the prior jobs, you know. Um, so it really wasn't any different. I was calling not for Citicorp, I was calling for myself, but uh, that was no problem. They recognized me as a bona fide professional in the business. And uh, so I was very familiar with the nuts and bolts of it because I had been on both sides buying and, and rendering those services already. And uh, I did, yes, I build up front and then I build in the middle usually and build at the end. And that was all spelled you, out too. Is your uh, sales cycle or, or life of the, the relationship, uh, could it vary 30, 90, six months? Yes, very much. Yeah. Okay. Just on the scope of the breadth of what you're doing, and then and right. then you play out obviously the the the. So how did how did you? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one good example for, and I can easily talk about this. I said before how you can't say much sometimes about a project. Yeah. And yeah. First, this is some years ago, so it's not sensitive anymore. Uh, it was for the Motley Fool, who I actually got that again to go back a little bit in the conversation. I joined also the Business Marketing Association. Because the American Market Association was pretty much all about consumers as a market segment. Whether they deliberately honed down to that or it just happened over time, there was therefore room for a business marketing association, B2B, marketing research in that sector. And I've done both. Some people are only one their whole career. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a polyglot. You know, I mixed up a lot of stuff. So, I, yeah, I got the Motley Fool opportunity out of being a member of that organization as a, just an association member and it was a great engagement a lot of fun focus groups uh, in person with investors because they were building a website which is in existence now at fool.com and uh oh, it's all caps it's about, great yeah you can look it up i have a page there that i did up back then just for fun but it's a service about sharing information about stocks on the stock market 
-hmm. and what you think they will do in the future gives you an opportunity to select any stock you want and say that you think it will beat or it will be worse than the S&P uh, over then some time period that you select. And you punch that in and you can make a comment if you want. And there's thousands of other people doing the same thing. And they built this from scratch and they built it from scratch based on working with me as their researcher to gather together a set of investors in a room and have a conversation. Well, sometimes it was a group, sometimes it was one at a time because we also wanted their actual feedback on the site itself and how to develop it. So it was uh, that kind of uh, creative design work as a research and interviewer, interviewing them and giving them tasks to do and watch how they succeeded or had trouble figuring out how to do that task in the site. So it's design you know, feedback from users, which is now a whole category of market research. Uh, user research and CX, it's called, you know, yeah. uh, or UX. Um, so I worked, that was a project lasted over a year, but it wasn't constantly on in terms of my work. You know, I did a phase of work with them, uh, different cities in the country, individual interviews, actual. Um, at first it was just on paper, then we would sit the respondents in front of a computer screen, have them try to do tasks and your feedback about it. And so it was waves of research and then development by Motley Fool. Then they come back and we do phase two. Again, more interviews and they go back. So that's why I say a year and a quarter or so, almost a year and a half. Not exclusive of all my time during that period, but it was all planned out ahead of time that far ahead when they gave me the you know uh, project. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, it's a good website now. It was based on the concept of proud wisdom. There's a book written about that. And I remember reading it. And, uh, you know, you can approach a difficult problem if you do it in a structured way with people that are relevant for that assignment or a solution to a problem and often get a better quality result. But it's not magic and you do have to have structure to it. Uh, like I said, there's a whole book written on it, how to do it right. And uh, I sort of found out in the course of doing that, that that's actually what we were doing. We were applying crowd wisdom. That was the concept of the website. And it's a success. And as a result, oh. after the developmental work in the first year, then we, they engaged me to do tracking as, as they actually put it in place. Mm -hmm. A couple of waves of interviews by phone, which I subcontracted for and wrote the reports, of course. Um, and that then uh, told them how well it was performing actually in fact in the real world after all the development work, you know? So it's a really nice assignment. No, oh, it's incredible. I mean, Motley Fool is a well-recognized well brand. Yeah. Uh, I think I've followed them for about five, 10 years now. And, okay. you know, it's always interesting to kind of see their insights and how they play off of, I would, I don't know if I've, I've seen them call Tesla, you know, five, 10 years ago, but yeah, right. you know, it does. Yeah. it's been an incredible journey for Tesla. And they just got in the S&P 500. So yes, I noticed that. Right. Incredible, incredible ride. So yeah. well, Nick, uh, Bart, you know, one thing that we like to end uh, our interviews with is, you know, there's uh, the C for CEO in this business format is about client experience. Right. Uh, he is for employee engagement, and it sounds like maybe you don't have employees per se because it's been a right. sole proprietorship. But you did mention subcontractors, and I'd love to hear about what, why they engage with you, why you keep them on, and, and that experience, and then operational excellence, and just a few words. But uh, so go ahead, and client experience. Why do you, what do you think that value proposition that ERM brings to the table? Sure. Okay. Uh, breadth of experience across many different types of market research projects. Uh, B2B, B2C, uh, qualitative and quantitative, short ad hoc studies that uh, have a beginning, middle, and end, and then they're done, versus some tracking so that it's an ongoing engagement. Uh, you know, I've done both kinds. And uh, so client engagement, uh, having been a client, I think, uh, and I found, you know, this helps oftentimes when I'm now on the side of working with clients and 
interested in meeting new ones. Having been one, I can understand many things they're saying to me, even when they're talking to me about the internal issues that they confront. And I've been there. And they like that about me, I think, and I can help them oftentimes add a little bit on top of just the, the facts of the project that we're proposing. You know, and uh, I know more about what might be the aftermath and how to anticipate that. Sure. Um, and lastly, the operational excellence. What do you think is that, that differentiator that you bring to the table? Yeah. Um, really caring. I'm good at detail work. Uh, and you do need it. You know, you're looking through tabulations uh, of uh, columns and numbers, and you got to get it right. So I care about that. And that goes without saying, but, you know, I say it. And uh, understanding the corporate side of it, my client side, you know, even when I was with the corporation after having been with the supplier at, at Citicorp, for example, where I built up this large staff, I was in the habit. It wasn't that I told my staff to refer to our internal users as clients. I just did myself. And I realized sometime into it that that was kind of uh, noticed by people because mm -hmm. none of them talked about each other as clients and, you know, consultants in a corporate. Now, normally you talk to them, you, you talk to them or refer to them as users, you know managers, whatever they are, I just always, and that, and I meant it in a respectful way, because that's how you do it when you're serving clients, when you're a professional. Um, so I think that plays out in terms of just a better relationship, even in an internal organization in the company. Uh, so let's see, operational, well, and the operational excellence, uh, on the supplier side, I pick suppliers carefully and often will know them and uh, uh, will use them if it's a first time use. I'll do it in a case where it's safe to do that. I don't need to know them intimately. It's a simple enough, straightforward project. I've been around long enough that when I listen to them tell me what they're recommending, I do. And sometimes they change my mind to a degree. And that's cool, you know. Um, so even if it's with one I hadn't used before, I know how to evaluate them. And I know the project has certain points that are maybe riskier than other points. And we know that ahead of time too. And if they understand what I'm talking about, I understand them. If we don't connect in those early phone calls, I know to find another supplier. Yeah. You know, so that's how I, I guess enforce and establish excellence in my mind. Uh, those are great attributes. I mean, you know, you, you really lay down a, a nice foundation uh, to what led to the ERM and, you know, right. it, your daily attributes, the things that you do to, to really build your own business. So uh, thank you so much, you know, Bart. Uh, you know, sure. really it's been a pleasure to kind of hear your wisdom, hear the stories. Uh, I hope the community gets a lot out of this. Uh, tell them a little bit about, uh, are you on LinkedIn? Facebook page, like what, what are some ways that you'd like for uh, potential people to connect with you? And, you know, right. six months from now, we're going to can reconnect with you, Bart, to yep. kind of find out where ERM is and maybe you brought on an apprentice or something like that, but uh, <laughs> right. we'll, we'll, we'll look to, to reconnect in six to 12 months, but tell the audience how to, how to, how to connect with you personally. Sure. Sure. Yes. Go to LinkedIn. I recommend that very much. I've uh, tried to maintain a good track record of, uh, uh, information there and in fact even recently I made a comment on something I saw in the literature about the method of measuring price sensitivity mm. that I had written about in this book 25 years earlier <laughs> so I won't go into any further but it's it's an amusing story that when I read his comment on why we should almost never use that method that I described in this chapter and used but I actually was able to agree with him because I only used it when I had figured out with the help of another guy I worked with for years, a way to improve on it and then use it. And so I actually gave a talk about that recently. Um, so I use LinkedIn and I 
recommend people get to know me there. There's some recommendations written for me, uh, references, you know, experiences, and my background. Also, um, um, my website, your-research-resource.com. And it's resource, singular at the end. <laughs> and because that's yeah. what I want to be, your research resource. I love it. I love it. Well, Bart, it's been a, such a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time. Uh, I know that uh, I called you off of a business card. We had met somehow. Uh, yeah. I've been doing these calls uh, recently. The last two months, we've been really kind of ramping up the content. And it's such a pleasure to have a business owner, a mindset, a, a hit, the background. And just the, the, the industry that you're in is so different. So it's really neat to have you on the Go for CEO channel. And I hope that people really get a, a great pleasure of learning uh, we'll also put your website in the in the uh, description area okay, as we post sure. it on YouTube. So thanks yeah, again, Bart, so. and uh, we look forward to seeing you six months from now. Great. Thank you so much. I look forward to it myself. Take care. Check out my website.